Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, hope all is well. Uh, hope no one is, uh, oh, actually some are getting over, maybe um, having been sick uh, over the holidays. So hopefully everyone is well and strong. Um, happy New Year. My mom says hello. My mom says Happy New Year to everyone. Every time I leave the house, she makes sure, she says, make sure you tell everyone I said hello. I said, okay. Um, okay, this morning, um, let's just read, I know we read Genesis 50. If you can open up Genesis 50 again, um, I just want to read a few verses, just a few, as we start this morning. Genesis 50, and just read seven verses, starting in verse 15. Um, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead... They said, Joseph will preadventure hate us and will certainly requit us all the evil which he, we did unto him. And he sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring it to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spake kindly unto them. This um, passage probably has the most important um, verse regarding God's providence. And that is right there in verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. We all know the story of Joseph, right? How his brothers conspired to kill him, but then sold him uh, for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites. They thought evil against him, but God had different intentions. He wanted to save many people alive. How do we define God's providence? The word is not even in the Bible. Nowhere will you find the word providence. But this word providence is used to define this relationship that God has with his creation. You know, all through uh, church history, there have been what's called confessions of faith, right? There's always been a, con a theological controversy uh, of the day. And out of that controversy, uh, they, they came up with a, a confession of faith. So one of them, there's four of them. Uh, who's got the slide there? I don't have the, okay, there you go, thank you. The first one uh, is what's called the Heidelberg Catechism. And it says, God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power. Thank you. Whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed, all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. So you might say, well, what's the difference between that definition and God's sovereignty and providence. What's the difference? Well, the difference is in that last phrase, but by his fatherly hand. You know, we think of a father's hand. What do we think of? We think of a father's love, his care, his protection for the well-being of the, for the, their child, right? For the goodness of his child. And that's the difference. God's providence speaks of his ultimate goodness for his children. Not to say that God's sovereignty 
there's no good in God's sovereignty, but God's providence is always, always purposed for the good of his children. There's another uh, confession of faith. It's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. And here they write, God, the creator of all things, thus uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least. But his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Again, the first section of this confession is clear. It's God's sovereignty. But this last section, to the purpose of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. God's providence has a specific purpose. The purpose is always and always for the ultimate good of his children. And we'll see that in this story. So Joseph's brothers, they had one purpose and one purpose only. What was that? To kill his brother. Why did they want to kill his brother? Well, he was favored, right? He was favored from his father. He was the son of his old age. And that's probably always a good um, parent strategy to have, right? To, to favor uh, little Johnny and, and make every one of the other children see that you favor little Johnny. But they also hated him because of his dreams. As it's recorded in Genesis 37, 7. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And as Joseph is saying this uh, dream, he has no guile. He's just really excited that he had this dream. And he's telling his brothers this dream. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, our sheaves stood and round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, God didn't reveal everything to Joseph in his dream, other than he sought to save much people. God didn't show Joseph how he was going to do it. God didn't show Joseph what he needed to go through to come to the point where God will eventually save a nation. His purpose, even when Joseph's brothers intended to kill him, God's purpose was always to save much people alive. So now there's this conflict. There's this conflict between God's providence and man's free will. Man has a free will, right? So this morning I want to just look at what this passage teaches us is man's response to God's providence. Man's response to God's providence. How do we live under this providence of God without knowing the knowledge of God? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have. Lord, we thank you for this passage that we can just get a glimpse and understand what is your providence? And what is our response, dear God, to your providence? Even when that providence conflicts with even the things that we do in our lives. Open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your word, to your leading. Strengthen and comfort us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, starting in Genesis 50, uh, 15, verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requit us all the evil which we did unto him. So, they saw their father, right? They saw their father dead, it says. Now, not necessarily are they talking about they saw their father dead in the coffin. But really, they saw the, what was the implication? What was the implication of his death, that Joseph will now hate us. And that word hate doesn't really mean dislike. Joseph, Joseph's brothers weren't really saying, you know, Joseph is really going to dislike us now. But it has this idea of persecution. Um, 
in, in 1991, um, uh, my unit got activated for Desert Storm. Uh, for those who don't know, in 1990, 1991, um, uh, the U.S. and this coalition of forces went to liberate Kuwait from Iraq. Uh, so my unit, which was a cold weather unit, so we had no desert training. Uh, we didn't know how to fight in, in the desert. So we had, they sent us to uh, California, the Mojave Desert which is, um, I believe the, 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 the base there is called 29 Palms, 29 Palms. So we went and did some desert training so we can be ready um, to, to go to, to Kuwait. And we had this one corporal, um, he was really, and I, I don't want to use any profanity, but you know, he was a donkey. Uh, he was a really hard nose and really, no, not many people liked him. Not many of the Marines liked him. Uh, so one day, um, he left the barracks. And when he left the barracks, um, some folks went to his room. And they took his furniture, took out the drawers first, right? They, they took out the drawers. And we knew all this, that they were going to do this. They took out the drawers, took the furniture, flipped it upside down, put the drawers back in, and then flipped the, the uh, uh, furniture back right side up. So what's going to happen, right? So... About half hour later, he comes back, and sure enough, you know, and all his furniture, his, his dressers, his, his desk, um, again, he wasn't really liked. Um, but a half hour later, he came back, and he calls us all out. He calls the whole platoon out. He was a corporal, so he was above us. We were just uh, privates, PFCs, and Lance Corporals. So he, and it was in the Mojave Desert, right? We're in the, we're in the summer heat. <laughs> and... Uh, he found out what they did, and uh, he made us run for five miles uh, in the heat, and it was painful. Um, but he didn't really hate us, right? He just made us pay for what we did, you see. But he, he didn't hate us. He, he had no reason to hate us. Uh, we thought it was funny. Uh, he didn't really think it was funny. But, and don't, kids, don't try to set home. <laughs> But he, he made his pay. And here, Joseph's brothers think, Joseph's going to make us pay for the pain and the sorrow, the misery that we made him go through. Their father was dead. Now Joseph was going to take his revenge, right? Is what they thought. So what do they do? What do they do in that first verse? They conspire. They conspire against Joseph. God has just delivered them from really a potential death by famine. And they conspire out of fear. Verse 16, and they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, Thy father did command before he died saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto the evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. Did Jacob at any time tell his brothers this? Turn to 40, Genesis 45. Genesis 45. Starting in verse 25. Genesis 45, 25. And they went up, up, and they went up out of Egypt... And came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is alive, and he's the governor of all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Jacob never tells his sons, hey, tell Joseph that I, I, I command him to forgive you guys for what you did to him. Now, when Joseph brought his brothers and his father, Jacob, back to Egypt, Joseph spent time with him. Joseph, Jacob could have told Joseph himself. 
We have no record of that. His brothers conspired. They lied. They were afraid. Okay? They were afraid that Joseph was now going to take revenge for all that they did to him. But Joseph, in, in, if you look up at verse 5, says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, verse 8, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. He hath made me a father of Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph is telling his brothers, don't worry, don't fear. Don't be angry with yourselves. This all happened because God intended to deliver you, to save you, to preserve you in posterity, a remnant in the earth. God was the one who sent me, not you. And you know, all that Joseph's brothers experienced of God's deliverance, God's fatherly hand in his goodness and mercy, Joseph's brothers still conspire and lie. What's the point? What's the point? Man's response to God's providence should be one of change. It should be one of change. A change of character, a putting off, and a putting on of a new nature. But, but this is going to be difficult, really, really difficult for Joseph's brothers. Do you remember what Joseph did? Or actually, what Joseph's brothers did when they went to kill him? But, you know, Reuben stepped in, right? Reuben stepped in and said, we can't kill our brother. So they threw him in a pit. Do you remember what the brothers did right after they threw him in a pit? They had lunch. Look at Genesis 37, 25. Look it up. They went and ate. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, they're having a pastrami sandwich, <laughs> sipping Kool-Aid, and their brother is in the pit in a scorching heat without water. The jealousy and the hatred that was in their brother's heart they had no regard for his brother's life, none whatsoever. They were totally desensitized. And you know, we need to learn from this actually. We really need to learn. Don't, don't think a Christian is immune to a hard heart. If we harbor jealousy and bitterness and anger, that could only lead to hatred. It can only lead to hatred towards one another. The result will be the same as Joseph's brothers, the same. Hatred breeds a murderous heart. What did we learn in 1 John 3? 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And you know that what? No murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Jesus in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and we're looking at that, we're memorizing that, and I hope, I hope, uh, you guys are having a good time memorizing this sermon. Um, it is an encouragement. I, I do challenge you to, uh, to memorize. And in verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that if whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So what Jesus is saying here is, it's not just the physical murder that now you will be in danger of the judgment, but now it's a spiritual thing. It's just having hatred in your heart for your brother. You will be in danger of the, of the judgment. Remember Cain? Cain hated his brother, right? Abel, because why? God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain. But God said to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, If that do as well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, if you provide an offering that is acceptable to me, I will accept it. And if thou do as not well, sin lies at the door. And we know the story. So, beloved, 
we really need to guard our hearts against having any kind of jealousy and bitterness and anger towards one another. That just breeds hatred. And you know, it's subtle. It was 17 years. Joseph was 17 years old when they did this to him. It took 17 years for this hatred to build. It's, it's, it's a subtle thing. It doesn't happen overnight. The Bible is clear. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And no murderer has to eternal life abiding in him. So this response should be a response of change under God's providence. The second response I want to look at um, is that Joseph's response to God's providence, but more specifically how he related to his brothers. Joseph's response and how he related to his brothers. In verse 19, it says, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place, in, for am I in the place of God? Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Man's response here to God's providence should be one of forgiveness, one of compassion, one of comfort. Joseph tells his brothers, after, he, after they plotted to kill him, after they sold him to the Ishmaelites, and, and after taking him away from the love of his father, and, and think about it, Joseph is alive, and he's probably bearing the burden of knowing that his father is probably crushed, thinking that his son is dead. And he's spending time in jail, probably around 10 years or so, for a crime he didn't even commit, thinking about all this. And he now faces his brothers 22 years later and tells them, fear not, fear not. I will nourish you, I will sustain you, but not only you and your children. This is the evidence. This is the evidence of true forgiveness. What evil has someone maybe done unto you in your life? Maybe has uprooted you or caused much pain and much sorrow in your life? Were you able to forgive them? You know, I hear, I've heard Christians many a times at least tell me, you know, maybe someone had done something to them and yeah, I forgive them, right? I forgive them. Uh, I hold no grudge against them. I may not talk to them. I may not have the same relationship with them, but I completely forgive them. You know, I give it up to God. Sure you did. Is this what we learn about God's forgiveness in this passage? Look at all that Joseph's brothers have done to Joseph. And here he's saying, fear not. And he's willing to, and he's comforting them and speaking kindly to them. And he said, I will sustain you, but not only you, you and your children. There was no grudge, no nasty words, no handshake. Okay, guys, you know, it's nice seeing you. See you around Goshen, you know. If I don't see you later, I'll see you in heaven. So true forgiveness, really, true forgiveness is, is a restored relationship. That's really true forgiveness. Joseph, when he was going through all his affliction, he really didn't understand what God uh, was doing. He didn't really understand God's providence. All he saw was the evil that others did to him in his life. You know, most of, no, most of you know that I have two sisters, right? Tina and Maria. Um, but most of you don't know that growing up, they didn't speak for 20 years. And we lived in the same house. And they lived in the same room. And it really, really pained my father. I mean, he had a broken heart for a long time. And somewhere around... I don't know, 2002 or th maybe three, 2003 maybe it was. My sister Tina, Maria was married already. My sister Tina, she met a guy. Um, and she was um, scheduled to be married <laughs> uh, in, in 2005. So they, they set a wedding date. Um, so 
um, we had an engagement party for my sister Tina. Um, and again, Marie and Tina aren't talking for 20 years. The Lord saved me um, September 18th, 1992. So I, from that moment on, prayed that God would reconcile their relationship. And, and even, even Helen, I had Helen pray. Helen's a prayer warrior. Um, so in 2005, it must have been maybe April, March or April, we had a small, really small engagement party for Tina. And um, so our whole family was there. Um, my niece and nephew weren't born yet, so it was just uh, my sister, my Tina, uh, Maria, and my brother-in-law, Sal, and, you know, uh, and their family, the, the, the guy's family. And um, the most amazing thing happened. Um, Tina and Maria hugged and kissed. And that brought so much joy to my dad. They reconciled. Wow. Wow. So a few months later, they were supposed to be married in June. A few months later, um, my dad got sick. Um, and uh, it was in June, right? I'm sorry, just trying to remember some, some things and cut out some things. Um, so... They were supposed to get married. And my, my sister found out some things about this guy. Five days before the wedding, she canceled. Can you imagine the apartment, um, the, the food, the flower, the hall, um, the honeymoon? They were going on a cruise. Five days before the marriage, she canceled. I commend her for it. I commend her. She found out things about him that were not good. Um, that was in June. Um, in, in August, my dad got diagnosed with um, a brain tumor, and he died in September. Um, but before he died, he got to see his two daughters after 20 years uh, of not speaking with one another. And the pain, the pain uh, of seeing your, your, two, your only two daughters, your only two daughters not speaking, under the same roof, in the same room. But, you know, God is good, Amen. right? God's providence. Look at God's providence, though. There were things in this guy's life that he did way before he met my sister. Things that happened that would eventually tell my sister, this is not the guy for you. Just enough time for God to reconcile their relationship, Tina and Marie's relationship. Just enough time from Tina to find out the information she needed to know before she married this guy. And just enough time before my dad passed away. And to give him some joy, right? Joy to his heart. God's providence. That is all God's providence. How far does God's providence go? You know, we take a look at the story of Joseph. How, how far does this providence of God go? Even in Joseph's story, what happens? God saves Joseph and his brothers, right? What happens in Exodus? God establishes the nation of Israel. What happens after that? What comes out of the nation of Israel? The line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus the Messiah. And God saved much people alive. Amen? All God's providence. Oh, God's providence. Can you say to someone who calls you much pain and sorrow, I forgive you. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. By the way, have you realized what set in motion God's providence? 
What set in motion is God's providence? Sin. Sin. Favoritism? Right? Jacob favored Joseph and made his brothers jealous, hatred, and greed. Right? They sold Joseph. We can't kill him. We'll get nothing out of it. Right? Let's sell it for 20 pieces of silver. But Joseph finally saw God's intended purpose. <clears throat> Verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. There's a double intention in this verse. Joseph's brothers intended evil. That's clear. Pure evil. Now, God didn't force Joseph's brothers to do this. God didn't guide Joseph's brothers to make the choices they made. God doesn't guide people to sin. But God meant it unto good. As Joseph's brothers had an intention in their choice, and that intention in their choice was purely evil, God had an intention in that same choice that they chose for evil, God in that same choice meant it for good. You see, there's a double intention. There are things in this life, God rules, you know, our lives from other causes. How he does all that, somehow, some way, I have no clue. But he does. He does. God works all that out for the good of his children. See, God's providence, it's, it's this ongoing relationship that God has with his creation. Amen. It's an ongoing relationship. As I close, there is one thing, one other thing really I wanna, want uh, to look at and really leave with you, just leave with you to meditate on. And that's Joseph's reaction to what his brothers say in verse 17. Look at, go back to 50, verse 17. It says, so shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did, un they did unto the evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. What made Joseph cry? What made Joseph weep? Well, the passage specifically doesn't tell us, but what can we gather from this passage? Well, look what he, look what he says. Uh, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. Wasn't it their father as well? They could have said our father, but they said thy father. You see? So what were they doing? They were appealing to that special relationship that Joseph had with Jacob. And that probably brought like memories to Joseph of being left, I mean, physically put in a pit, right? Being left there to die and then being sold to the Ishmaelites, spending all that time in prison for a, a, a crime he didn't commit. And he weeps. But not only that, what does Joseph hear? What does he hear? Again, I firmly believe that, and they said they sent a messenger. Um, maybe they were afraid to be in his presence. I don't know. I, I think it was Benjamin. That's my opinion. Um, you know, Benjamin uh, is his, is his um, blood brother and, you know, close to him. And they grew up together. Uh, maybe he's got some pull. I don't know. But that, that's my opinion. That's my guess. I didn't get that at any, anything but my opinion. Um, but what does Joseph hear in this command from their father? Fear. He hears fear and guilt and anxiety that their brothers still felt for what they did. See, God had already, already, you know, 
took Joseph beyond his misery and sorrow. All that pain, it was gone. But his brothers still were carrying that guilt. For 22 years, still carrying that guilt. And Joseph tells them, fear not. Am I in the place of God? It wasn't Joseph's place to seek vengeance. The Bible says vengeance belongs to God. Leviticus 19.18. And really, this is what Joseph lives by. Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. So, Joseph weeps here. But this is not the only place Joseph weeps. Turn to Genesis 42. Genesis 42. In, this, in Genesis 42, this is the first time Joseph's brothers go down um, to Egypt to get food, to get corn. And Joseph recognizes his brothers. And Joseph remembers <laughs> the dream he had. And what does he say? Ye are spies. Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And in verse 19, if ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty. And this is in Joseph's presence. We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul 22 years later. When we besought us, when he besought us, and we would not hear, therefore is his distress come upon us. Verse 22, and Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And you would not hear? Didn't I tell you so? And you didn't listen to me. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not Joseph understood them. That, that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by interpreter. And what did he do in verse 24? And he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. Why did Joseph weep? Finally, after 22 years, he's reunited with his brothers. Did Joseph hate his brothers? Did Joseph hate his No. Not at all. Not one bit. So he's reunited. He's happy. Right? Partly these are, joy, these are tears of joy. And then he sees God's hand of providence. He sees God's mercy. God's goodness upon his brothers. But he sees that his brothers are still living under the guilt of their sin. And he weeps. But he doesn't want to show them. Genesis 43.30. You don't have to turn there. Genesis 43.30. And Joseph made haste. For his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber and wept there. Again, another time, Joseph weeps. And doesn't want to weep in front of his brothers. 45 verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while J Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. In verse 2. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in, in the house of Pharaoh heard. Down to 14. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren, and went up upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Why am I reading all these verses? What's the point? Well, they say that Joseph is a what? Type of Christ, right? They both were shepherds. They were both hated by their brethren. They both had distinct clothing, right? Joseph had his coat of many colors. Jesus had the garments that they, that they um, um, uh, casted lots. Uh, their future sovereignty was, proph was prophesied, right? Joseph in his dream, Jesus by the prophets and the angel Gabriel. They were both sent forth by their father 
Remember, Jacob was the one. Jacob was the one who sent Joseph out to see the, the welfare of their brothers as they were feeding the flock. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 pieces. There are three times that Jesus in Scripture, at least that, that we have record of, wept. John 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and he speaks those powerful words to Martha, right? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Luke 19, Jesus weeps over at Jerusalem, knowing what will befall the city and what will shortly come to pass at Calvary. Here, their king, the king of the Jews, is right with them, offering the kingdom, and they reject him. Jesus on earth, as a man, wept for the souls of men. And now, where is he? Seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. My question is this. Is Jesus weeping for us? Joseph wept for his brothers. And Joseph is a type of Christ. Is Jesus weeping for us? Why would Jesus even weep for us? Well, for the same reason Joseph wept for his brothers. Jesus wants us to experience his forgiveness. Not live under the guilt of sin. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. Why live under that guilt? Jesus wants an intimate communion. We're going to have communion today. We will partake of his suffering, right? Of his table. Jesus wants an intimate communion with us so we can experience his goodness, his mercy, his nurturing hand, right? That sustains us. Not a hand of vengeance, not a hand of judgment. Jesus wants us to abide freely under his grace, sustaining us through this life. So, beloved, we are not here by chance at all. We are here by God's providence. Amen. How will you respond? How will you respond? Will you change? Will you put off your nature and put on a new nature? Will you forgive and comfort? those who did much evil to you? Will you experience his forgiveness and live under the grace and mercy and goodness that he provides? Let's stand for prayer.